And we're live. Hello, welcome to Pursuit of Perfect System. And thank you very much for joining me and a very special guest for another special guest live stream video. And as with all my live stream videos, get involved. Really interested to get your thoughts, opinions, and definitely questions. So questions for today's special guest, who is Carl Heinz Fink from Fink Team. Carl, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thank you. So it's seven o'clock in the evening here. I'm sitting alone in the company, nobody there. So we have all the time that we need. Well, look, first of all, thank you very much for coming on the live stream and joining me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's also fun. I think it's the first time I do a live stream. Uh, but I have done a few YouTube videos uh, with other people. Uh, but it's different to be live, to be honest. Um, so I have to make sure I'm not saying anything stupid because it will be recorded as well and many people will listen to it. Well, look, let's, let's put us both on the screen. And as it's your first time coming live, I'll be gentle and take it easy with you. But just to let, obviously, the viewers know, what we're going to do is work through a, a series of questions. First of all, I would like to speak to you about the Borg speakers that I've just reviewed maybe ask a few questions about them and get rid of your thoughts and feelings and, and opinions on a few things. Then if it's okay, I'd like to speak to you about the Wolfdale Diamond 12 range of speakers that I reviewed recently as well. Um, then I've got a few general questions to ask you. Then I'm going to go over to the, uh, obviously the audience and the viewers to ask their questions. Okay, okay, great. Perfect. Fine. Well, look, obviously in terms of the Borgs, and I'll quickly throw up a picture of them now. There we go. That's from our recent review. Very, very impressive speakers, Carl. Very impressive for lots of different reasons. But when you when you initially look at them, and this could be the case for other people as well, the, the driver array, only using two speaker drivers, as opposed to maybe three, four, five, 15, initially seems a little bit unusual. So what was the reason for using two drivers and not using more? Because we can. Now, OK. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, we started with the with the WM4 with a big one, and that was a three-way system with a large 15-inch, uh, two flat mid-range, and an air motion transformer. Uh, so we had actually a three-way. Uh, and when we spoke about the next model down, um, I think it was actually Steve Harris, the guy who worked with us in the beginning, the one that is also doing a lot of PR. Um, he said, why we don't do a two-way system? Because, you know, there are not many two-way systems around. There are tons of three- and four-way and, and all sorts of loudspeakers. Uh, why we don't do a two-way system? And for me, this was a challenge because, I mean, you know, having such a big speaker and an air motion transformer, uh, it's not so easy to put them together. And it took some time and it, we had to do something unusual. Uh, but at the end of the day, we got it. And... Um, if you know what a crossover is doing in a loudspeaker, and it's really independent from first, second, third, fourth, or whatever order, they always have a problem. There's only one crossover in theory where you have a flat response curve on axis, and it's, you know, the power, you know, all the energy outside of axis is the same than on axis. Um, this is only one uh, way, but that doesn't work very well um, because but I don't want to talk too much about that. That would be too complicated. Um, but everything else is a compromise. So you have to have a flat response curve, but then a little bit of energy outside of axis is missing. Or you have a flat res uh, power response, as we call it, and then you have some problems on axis. Um, whatever you do, it will all be there. And so that means the best is a full full range if you can. Um, but that has, of course, a problem because, I mean, it's difficult to do a woofer that does both ends. Um, as I said yesterday, you know, if you're happy with something in the middle to play, then fine. Uh, so the two-way is the best compromise in terms of, um, yeah, on axis, out of axis, power response, um, and it's a very classic system. And, you know, the old, very old loudspeakers have always been two-way. And look at the dual concentric, you know, it's a 15-inch it's a with, with a horn tweeter in the middle. So that is two-way. 
And in theory, you know, um, um, an air motion transformer really doesn't like to go low. So we are crossing over at around 1600 hertz. And we couldn't get an air motion transformer that was really doing it. Um, so we had to work on it. I mean, it's we, we get the parts from, from Mundorf, the good friends, um, and then we build one by one uh, in the factory here uh, in our uh, in our anechoic chamber. Somebody is sitting there and putting the damping in and really, you know, tailor it to the response curve that it should have and also to the distortion. Um, and the woofer does three kilohertz. It really goes up to three kilohertz oh, wow. straight with very low distortion. So we got everything that we wanted. Um, and from the power response, because of course a, a big woofer starts beaming, uh, but an air motion transformer has a wide dispersion in that direction and a little bit, uh, you know, reduced in that direction. So if you get the crossover right, then you have a halfway flat um, power response curve. So that means out of axis, it, it's still relatively smooth. What can happen when you have a big one and a, and a smaller tweeter is that when you look at the energy into the room, there's a big hole in the middle, and then it comes back when the tweeter sets in, uh, comes in. And, and so this is something, of course, that we, we looked for. Um, and we, um, yeah, I think we got a quite good solution. And so we had a loudspeaker that not everybody could do and not everybody does. Um, because we definitely don't want it to have a Me Too loudspeaker. Yeah, okay, okay. So just just to clarify then what you, what you just said there. So in terms of p picking the best combination of what you could power the response, which is really even sound, isn't it? How the speaker puts its sound out into the room. Is that correct? Yeah. So really yep. it's a, ca a case of trying to find the best balance of, of all the characteristics. So did you start with the tweeter or did you start with the woofer, just out of curiosity? I think we, we start with both. I mean, you know, we, so um, so we didn't know the crossover frequency before we really started with the crossover. So you know, we can simulate a lot, and we can we know exactly how the crossover measures before we even build it. But no simulation tells us how it sounds like. Okay. Um, so you know, you have to you have to make one, two, three, four, five, six variations. Listen to them. And then pick the one that you really like, um, and that sounds good. The crossover has a lot of extra, you know, tricks in. Um, for example, and that is something I found out years ago when working with air motion transformers, they really have a problem to to play in sync, as I call it, with the woofers. Many many loudspeakers, you know, you hear the air motion transformer and you hear the woofer and nothing in the middle or it doesn't fit together. So actually, we use a kind of passive delay on the on, on the tweeter, you know, just to quickly, align. Just, just quickly, Carl, is that because the tweeter is so much faster than the bass driver? Is that what it is? No, 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 I don't think. Why? It, yeah, I mean, a tweeter has to be fast because if it's not fast, it's no tweeter. So this is one of the stories, you know, some people tell me about a, a woofer or a bass that is fast. And I always say, yeah, but if it's fast, it must be a tweeter because a, a woofer doesn't have to be fast. No, it's just that you get when the, that you get the face together between the loudspeakers. Um, and I'm not only looking at a few, uh, you know, at a small area in the crossover, we're also looking down on the, on the roll off and on the slope. And so this kind of uh, delay just gave us the best result. Okay, okay. That actually leads me quite nicely onto, I've got an image here of the crossover. So that actually looks, is, is that is that a simple crossover? Or is that a complex crossover? Out of curiosity, <laughs> I mean, you know, it looks like a complex one, as you can see. There's a lot of components on it, um, but you know, some of them belong to the switching unit, uh, so the, to the adjustments. And um, I think the two white one, what is it called, C seven, C eight, one of those inductors. And the second one, this is actually the the passive delay, uh, where we where we set the um, or where we try to adapt uh, the woofer with a tweeter or to combine. Uh, so that is relatively easy. It's, I think it's a third order crossover 
on the Twitter and, and the second order with some EQ um, filtering uh, for the woofer. Um, I mean, there's, you, you can, you, you show the impedance, if you can go back to the impedance. Yeah, sure. um, you see that there, you have this um, flat area in the midband, you know, it goes up and then it's flat and then it goes down. This is actually, normally there's a big peak in the middle. Um, and that is because, you know, that's a crossover constellation because you have to bring down the woofer at lower frequency because it has a rising character. Most of loudspeakers have that. Um, and there's a filter in to get this uh, peak out. And we do that specially for, for tube amplifiers. Because, I mean, you know, tube amplifiers have a relatively high output impedance in many cases. Um, and it helps when you take that out. Otherwise, you have some colorations in the midband that just related to the, um, to the, to the output transformer. To be honest, Carl, that actually might lead us quite nicely onto something that I actually missed from my review is that obviously I spoke quite a lot about the sound adjustment controls because I thought that was really fantastic. And in terms of flexibility, in terms of how much how much they made a difference and how little they made a difference at the same time, I was really impressed by that balance. But one thing I didn't speak about was the damping controls, which you can see there obviously on the far left, settings one, yeah. two and three. Uh, obviously, can you explain what they are for and what they do, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have to tell a little bit the story of how we, we got this, um, this damping in anyway. Um, some, some years ago, I was working on a loudspeaker where we tried to really get the distortion down. Um, and we got the distortion down on the driver, and then we put it into a box, we made a crossover, and at the end, the distortion was higher than without the crossover. I said, that sounds strange and it shouldn't be. And I remember that when I was still doing DIY, so in the beginning of the 80s, late 70s, um, a friend of mine uh, did for, for a DIY magazine, did a kind of measurement setup where he measured all available cores for inductors. Because I mean, you know, normally you have a laminated steel core, a ferrite core, you know, some some iron powder, different ways of making um, an inductor. And the reason is that you want to have a high inductance, depending on where you cross over, with a relatively low resistance, you know, to get the damping factor from your amplifier. Um, but all those cores um, are generating distortion. Um, some are like the laminated steel cords, they always have a kind of yeah, distortion floor. There's always some distortion going on, but you can hammer them like mad and they will never go really and, and saturate. Um, and then you have others like ferrite. Um, they have very, very low distortion at smaller signals, but then you get at a point in that whoosh, it really goes up and then they're really heavily distort, depending on the material. Um, so you have to choose which one you use, but one problem you definitely have, you have some higher one at, at lower levels and no problems at higher levels and the other way around. The only inductor that doesn't have this problem is the air core. So that means there's no iron or no hysteresis generating whatever material. And, um, but the problem is when you, if you want to have an, an inductor with low resistance you need really huge ones you know i mean this is something that i used before in in a loudspeaker oh, wow. let's go up <laughs> um, and and it is heavy and costs a lot of money um and it also generates stray field um so that you have to really take it away from from the rest of the crossover um and then I, you know, when we design a loudspeaker, when we start, you know, with the whole cabinet and the re reflex port and all these things, we um, we calculate an, a resistance for the inductor in because it has an influence on the alignment, how the roll off is, how the behavior of the reflex port is, or the box, the combination, uh, and that was usually 0 0.2, 0 0.3. That's all the standard value. Um, and I said, what happens if we go for one ohm? Because 
if I want to have a resist uh, an inductor 1.4 millihenry and you know a size that is halfway manageable, um, then you easily have 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, um, and you know to to just see the worst case, I put in my simulation um, 1.2 or 1.5 even. And of course, then you get a really bad behavior on the bottom end. So it's going up and looks really strange and it's ringing. But you can compensate that when you have access to the, to the driver components. And it's relatively easy to compensate that with a different magnet. So you compensate that with a magnet, and then you get the same thing out uh, than you would normally have with a, with a low resistance um, inductor. Um, yeah, we tried that out and it worked perfectly. And he said, okay, fine. But as I said, I, I have a little bit um, too much resistance. And instead of trying to find a magnet size in between, we said, why we don't use that to adapt the, um, the speaker to the amplifier? So, you know, modern transistor amplifiers have almost a really high damping factor, of that really huge damping factor. Um, then we have the medium H or technology amplifiers. They have something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 resistors actually in series with a cable name, for example, the classic name amplifier is exactly like this. And then, of course, you have tube amplifiers. I mean, we cannot we cannot compensate for uh, you know 300 B triode three and a half watt thing that has four ohm output resistance in the transformer or whatever. Um, but for a KT88 EL34 or a similar push pull, um, you can get away with something like half an ohm. So therefore, the damping factor is actually the resistor that is in series with the whole loudspeaker to compensate for, um, for the output resistance of your amplifier. So the zero one is the one where it's nothing. Um, no, it's true. It's not true. It's the highest one, of course, because it's for modern amplifiers. Um, so when you have a name, for example, you go the first step and that compensates for the resistor that is anyway um, in the amplifier. And the third one would compensate for sort of um, tube amplifiers. The good thing is you can also use it if you don't have a tube amplifier or whatever, because it changes the roll off, you know, so from here to here, it makes it a little bit flatter. So it changes the way the bottom end rolls off. And that is sometimes nice if you compensate in a room. So that means you can use that also uh, to play a little bit with your room. But the original intention was to compensate for the damping factor of your amplifier. Yeah, because that, that's one of the things that stood out to me <clears throat> about the Borgs is the, the level of control and the level of adjustment. Um, and, and the damping factor is just an additional one. So just to, to, to clarify there, so it's, you know, if, if you're using a, a, like a, a traditional or a, a more typical tube amplifier, you would probably put the Borg on number three, setting three. I'll just pop it back up. And then obviously with a, a, a more modern tr transistor, a solid state amplifier, you would probably go on number one. But maybe certain yeah. amplifiers might sound better on number two. And maybe yeah. number two might just sound better based on your room as well. Yes. Interesting. Because, again, it's it, after playing with them and having them in a speaker system, it, it felt to me like, why do we not see more of them? So is, is this a very difficult thing to implement, Carl? And wh why do you think we don't see it on more speakers? I mean, uh, you see, the reason why we did it is relatively easy. Um, when we are listening in here in Think Team, um, it's not me alone. You know, the, the name is Think Team because we are a team. And actually, it only works as a team and, and we have specialists for so many things. Um, but we also listen with several people. And um, on a normal loudspeaker, you have to find a compromise. But it's really nice. You know, we, we have, you know, people like um, Walter, you know, our senior. He's the one who is very much into pling pling and, and all these things at high frequency. Um, and he likes classical music a lot. So 
and and he listens for sound stage depths and he listens to resolution on the on the top end um I'm more in the mid band, you know, image, image width um, is, is important to me, but mid band voices and, you know, saxophone, guitars. So that is my world and it has to sound okay for me. Um, and Norbert, um, who is more or less running the organization of Think Team and also the, the guy who is in charge of Wood, he, um, he plays bass. So he's a bass player, so of course he needs his music and all the, you know, the Marcus Billers of this world or whatever has to sound good. Um, but he can live without a tweeter. So when we have a normal loud speaker and he normally comes to me and says, look, the tweeter is really nice. I know, oh God, I have to make it one dB higher uh, because that is his personal preference. Um, and Walter, for example, has his Pavarotti and he plays it and said, oh, the Pavarotti is a little bit too much on the front. Can we get it a little bit more to the back? If he is happy, I know mm, I have to bring it a little bit to the front. <laughs> so and so we have all the, the different characters um, that have a slightly different uh, way of listening. And on a normal loudspeaker, you make a compromise. And on the Kim we set, we put all the options that we want, because that are all the small changes you would have to do to make it optimum for Norbert, for uh, Walter and for me and we put that in because they are tiny little things and, and and that's why we had this this control is that everybody from us must be uh, or should adjust the loudspeaker in a way he really likes and these are wide areas but only tiny little levels I mean it's half a dB or whatever um, so that is one thing. So that was important for us. So everybody can set it to the way he likes. The second thing is, at the end of the day, a loudspeaker is, is a part of a setup. So um, the whole the whole chain is important. And um, I mean, yeah, you can you can think, okay, my upper mid band is a little bit too bright. So you can go to your dealer and buy you an expensive cable, hoping that this is helping you a little bit to tame that area or you go on the back of the Borg and you set the presence a little bit a step back and then you would have something that is a little bit smoother. So it is a tool or it's a set of tools for 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 adjusting the complete um, yeah, balance of, a, of an amplifier with, with, with CD player and cables and everything. So it's a kind of toolbox for 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 adjusting the the complete uh, balance of your setup. Yeah, I, I thought it was fantastic to be honest, Carl. Purely because you can sit and listen, you can make the adjustments, and, and they're, they're substantial enough for for them to make a difference enough for you to judge if you like it, if not, or if you want to go more, if you want to go back. But they, they didn't really change the overall character of the speaker too much. So, you know, like the tonality and. and it, so how that happens is beyond me. It's really, really clever engineering. So you should pat yourself on the back for that one. Uh, I mean, again, you know, this is more or less what we do every time when we design a loudspeaker. It's only that we just, this time we put it as a control on the back and not set it down on one side and say, okay, we'll make it that way. So it's not so complicated if you know where you change things. A couple of things I'd like to speak to you about with the Borgs. I'm just going to pop them up. In terms of the, the cabinet, in terms of the cabinet shape and the cabinet construction, what, what is going on there? What is it designed that way to sound a certain way? Does the shape of it affect the sound? Obviously, the, the build quality and the structure will, but does the shape affect the sound as well? I mean, you know, the designer, this loudspeaker is not done by accident and it was not done by an acoustic engineer that is crazy enough uh, to make a drawing of a, of a cabinet. Uh, this design uh, was done by Kieran Dunk. He's a quite well-known designer, and I worked with him, oh, God knows how many years. So he was more or less the guy in, in Mission, uh, who did all the Mission loudspeakers. Uh, he did all the Q acoustic loudspeakers. Um, he did a lot of other loudspeakers for other companies I cannot say, <laughs> talk about, but he did a lot. So he's really somebody who has a certain style. And if you compare all admission ones and you look at the um, at the Q acoustics, you see his fingerprint in a way. 
uh, when I asked him, Kieran, would you like to do the design of my speakers? He said, yes. Um, and I sent him a, you know, um, a copy of a page of a book uh, from Mr. Olsen, an old acoustic guy, you know, I think this was from the 50s, um, where he had a list of um, cabinet shapes that would give the best result or the little, as little diffraction, diffraction as possible. And a ball would be the best one, but yeah. I don't want to have one. <laughs> and, and, and so the next one was then in a way like the, the top part of the, the Borg, and that's why we did it. So we wanted to have low diffraction effects um, to make the crossover relatively easy and have a uniform uh, dispersion. Um, yeah, and to be honest, when we got the first drawing, that's why we have the name, it was just looking like a Borg because it was big things here and things there and, you know, like, so, <laughs> and we never, we never, um, yeah, we never stopped using the name and we decided at the end to put the name on the loudspeaker. Um, so the design is not accident. Obviously, uh, just, um, yeah, I think we've covered the questions I wanted to ask you about that, Carl. I actually want to speak to you about uh, another speaker, a new speaker from you guys, which is the Kim. Because yeah. obviously looking at that, you can see some similarities to the Borg. So it, it reminds me a little bit of Mini-Me from, you know, from uh, Austin Powers. You get the the mini me character of, of the, obviously the big guy. So is it mm. like, is it like a mini Borg is, is, you know, a lot of the Borg in the Kim? I mean, you know, we have three, three important parts, uh, drive units, crossover cabinet. Um, so both speakers, you know, have, we, we look at those three things. Um, the woofer of course is a smaller one, so it will never have the same output that we can have from a Borg. But the response curve looks pretty similar. You know, I mean, it even goes to the same bottom and extension, um, but it has a lower sensitivity. So, you know, Bob has a higher sensitivity, Kim has a little bit less sensitivity. On the other hand, it also goes low down. So does that mean it needs more power to achieve the same amount of base output? Is, is, is that what you mean by that? I think it's, it's general. I mean, this is, uh, I learned that from Ted Jordan, you know, uh, my old friend and mentor, who always said it's bandwidth against sensitivity. So, you know, you can make something that has a huge bandwidth, but you can only do it by bringing down the sensitivity or increasing the cabinet volume, for example. Um, and so, you know, you have to choose what you want. Uh, if you want something that goes down to 15 hertz, then the sensitivity will be screwed. So in our case, we have um, the bandwidth almost the same, but the cabinet is a lot smaller, the driver is smaller, so the sensitivity is lower. And that is, I think it's about 2 or 3 dB. Okay, okay. So, so I'm just going to, apologies if my volume's been a little bit low. Thank you, Riggles Wade, for pointing that out. It's, it's difficult because I, I can't listen to my own volume and listen to Carl because I hear an echo of myself. So sorry, I'm a little bit too far from the mic. But obviously what, what interested me about the Kim is obviously the form factor because it's it's got that lovely kind of retro shape and design, very akin to obviously you know, speakers from, from, from decades ago. And I suppose the price point because it, it's a much more accessible price point. Um, so I suppose to anybody who's watching this who, who liked the idea of the Borg speaker, is the, so the Kim is going to give them a lot of what the Borg speaker can give them in a smaller form factor, a, a more affordable price point. Is that correct, Carl? That was the idea, yeah. That's why we did it. Um, the, you know, the, there was a comment on, on the review that I saw um, on your review saying, oh, you know, they are crazy, they... They ask too much money, you know, they should make it for half of it. I wanted to invite this guy to show me how he does it for half the money because I know how expensive and how difficult it is to make those cabinets. Um, so the, the cabinet for, for Borg is really, 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 really complicated. Um, because, you know, we wanted to make something, you know, the best we could, and it should, be, should have been a statement. When we worked on the board, we said, let's make a square box. 
because there's no 90 degrees or whatever on the board. Uh, let's make a square box and shape the front in the same way as Borg, that we get a similar character. Uh, but then with a, with, a, with a square box, we can make things a lot easier. And so, you know, making the cabinets of the, of the Kim is a fraction of the time that we need for the Borg. So that's a pretty big part of, of, of the price. Um, and the, you know, all the, the benefits, you know, having multiple layers with some glue in the middle and some damping and special bracing and some extra damping material here and something inside of the front baffle and things like that. We do in, in the same way in the Borg um, and in the Kim, uh, but in the Kim, due to the fact that it was a square box, more or less, um, made it a lot easier. So, yeah, it is something that gives you a lot of what the Borg gives you uh, for a lower price. And basically, the form factor is, I wanted to have something that is easy to integrate into a room. I mean, some people think that Borg is ugly. I heard comments like, looks like a coffin or whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, you like it or you don't like it. Uh, thanks, God, people like it. So... Uh, but I can understand if somebody says, I don't want to have a monster in my in my living room. And I'm not talking about Borg, but many other loudspeakers are relatively monster-like when you have them in a standard uh, living room. So the idea was to have something that is restricted in height. Um, I said, you know, like your window shelf or like the heating system or like a chair or... You know, a table, that is the height around 80, 85, that you don't see. Because, I mean, you're always in a room where there's a lot below 80 uh, centimeter and the rest is that open. Um, and in order to achieve that, we had to tilt the loudspeaker back, because otherwise we would never get the height in, in, in the stage. Oh, wow. um, and um, so that was then the beginning of, of the stand that we have. Um, another nightmare, I must say, it's really difficult to make because there, there's also no 90 degrees. So they have to weld this together and, and it's really difficult that we only found one company so far that was capable of doing them so that when you get them and you put them on the speaker and screw them on, they fit. Is that, is that oh. when you buy the speakers, do they come with the stands? No, 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 no. Okay. I mean, the cabinets of the, I mean, actually... Um, the cabinets we make the back part, the front part, and the stand is done separately. Okay, okay. Um, but we put it together so when you get the loudspeaker, it's all complete. Oh, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, so the speaker comes with the stand, so it's not like yeah, you need yeah. to buy a separate stand. It, it all comes no. complete, so that way you've got the perfect stand, shape-wise and height-wise for the speaker, haven't you? Yep. Yeah, that makes that was sense. It. Um, yeah, and the rest, I mean, the, the woofer, um, the woofer is, is a smaller one, but it has most of the options of the big one. Uh, the only thing we didn't do was the corrugated cloth surround that we had on the board. I would love to have, to have had it, but it was really difficult um, to control the stiffness of the surround because the mass is not so heavy because the big one is heavier. And um, you need a certain resonance frequency so that your alignment works. Are, are you talking about the, the ridges around the edge of the, the base driver? Is that what yeah, you're yeah, referring yeah. to? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Is it's that... corrugated cross and with some doping on. Okay. And, and did I get that correct in the review? Hopefully you saw it where I, that's for low hysteresis. Is that – because when I Googled that term, it came up as, like, as memory. So I figured if energy stores there, it will slow the driver down. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what, what rubber surrounds like. Not every rubber is doing it. Uh, so there are rubber, um, yeah, rubber kinds of rubber that don't do it, uh, that we use. Um, you know, you will have seen that maybe in other uh, white papers where I was talking about it. Um, get as little hysteresis from your surround as, as, as possible. Um, and corrugated cloth surround is fine, but it wasn't really possible to do it in a reliable way. So we had to use rubber, but we used the rubber that isn't high damping. 
You, you know what? That's really interesting because when I think of a speaker system, I think of you know drivers. I think of cabinet. I think of crossover. You don't always think of how important the, the surround is for the drivers. It's not something you necessarily think about as a non-speaker designer. So it's quite interesting to talk about that. I can tell you. I mean, when we design the drive units, you know, most of the time we are dealing and, and, and fighting with the surround. So where you have the, the first mode, I mean, you know, we call it this way, you know, when when at a certain frequency, the the outer part of the of the cone starts to flap around and it's loaded by the surround. Um, and it depends on the shape and how you do it to get this mode corrected and um, and yeah, and, and flat and low distortion. So it's, it's a big thing <laughs> and it's really difficult. Uh, and we spend a long time to get the uh, surround correct, uh, the correct surround for the for the cone shape. Well, yeah, that's really interesting. I'm just going to kind of segue into the next thing I want to discuss with you, Carl, because uh, David Tomset has put a, quite an interesting thing. I think it was David. Uh, if you could make speakers for under a hundred pounds, you would clean up. Is what he's, he's written. But I thought that would move us quite nicely onto talking about Wharfdale and the work that you've done recently for Wharfdale because. Those are what I would class as very, very good, very affordable speakers. I mean, obviously, I've only played with one of them, but the, the experience I had with the one would lead me to be, feel very confident that the rest are going to be you know, equally good, but bigger and, and able to deliver more. So um, what I was going to ask was, obviously, in terms of when you're designing speakers for Think Team and then you're designing speakers like the Diamond 12s for Wharfdale, do, do you try and take the same approach into both projects? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know what, because I mean, my, my marketing guy who I know is in, is, is watching this will probably kill me, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hi David. Um, no, but it's, um, of course, you know, we, we have something in our heads, mm -hmm. how we like a loudspeaker to be and the three base elements like cabinet, crossover drive units is the same for everything it's just you know where you end up with a with a result um i mean when when you do a cabinet like the 12.1 yeah there is no you know no no glue in the middle and no exotic materials and you know all those things and and, and tubes here and absorbers there and resonators on this end you can't do that for the money but you can try to clean up the cabinet as good as possible. And, you know, sometimes a brace at the right position will make the cabinet really good and doesn't make it extremely expensive. So the Borg is just, you know, the top we could do. The, the Wolfdale is what we can do for the price that it costs. Um, but if you, if you are sensitive to those kind of vibrations and problems, how can you forget it when you do another loudspeaker? I mean, Think Team is, is our brand and our loudspeakers, and it's what we are. Um, this this Wolfdale loudspeaker is, first of all, sometimes I personally like to do, because, uh, you know, not everybody got 25,000 for a pair of loudspeakers. Um, and, you know, so far, hi-fi high-end is for old people. If you want to attract young people, you just have to offer them something that is affordable. And um, thanks, you know, iPod or iPhone, where people are back to two-channel, um, because before that we had so much multi-channel that I thought the future would be then AV. Um, yeah, there is two-channel, but you have to do something that is affordable, uh, easy to use, um, so that yeah everybody can can have something that sounds nice, and um, so for this Wolfdale is very similar. I mean, you see, you have a picture of this um, of of the Wolfdales. Oh yeah, sorry, I should yeah. have put that up already. Apologies. Well, here's a picture of my review for starters. So go yeah, and check the review yeah. out, and then obviously a picture of the speakers. You know, the full yeah, range you, you see all these cones, you see these this notches and this these things that we implement into the material. Um, you know, this is something where you need to know what the cone is doing and you need to simulate them and to, you know, 
And then when, when you have that, and you have the result, the price to make the cone is the same than one without, because it's just changing the tooling. And once the tooling is done, you can make those cones. So that means know-how that we, of course, use for the big speakers can be brought down to the cheaper speakers. Um, and, and, you know, and we, we work on with, uh, with the same principles, low distortion, low hysteresis, nice, fast sound if possible, um, but within the limits of the budget, of course. Yeah. But it's more, it's a, it's a kind of, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. You see, I mean, a year ago, uh, my friend Ishiwata, Ken Ishiwata died. So, and he was one of those guys who was always teaching me and showing me how important it is to do affordable hi-fi. He loved high-end as well, but with the same sort of, you know, motivation and passion he was working on cheap entry level cd players just to offer people um some some yeah some affordable hi-fi and that was always my intention you know i mean i did a lot of budget speakers in the past the mercury for uh, for tenoy the reveals for tenoy the revolutions for tenoy a lot for mission i forgot the the ranges we did quite a lot also for for more than short at the time they were working with um with with Marans in distribution so there was a history and 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 i still believe that we have to do something for for future generations otherwise you know they will end up with a pair of cheap in-ear headphones and they are lost for hi-fi at least T to be honest i think it's absolutely fantastic to have you know affordable speakers that can perform to a really really high level because you know for, for starters it I, it helps people to fall into love of listening to music and listening to music at a high standard because then you know everybody needs to start somewhere but but the same flip side not everybody as you say can afford very very high end speakers so if they can get really great sound for their money that, that's just just a great thing in general i just think that's absolutely fantastic and as i, say, I was particularly impressed with the 12.1s they are you know what are called ridiculously good for the money so uh good skills yeah well that's very that's something very british as you know you know yeah. i mean i i know i don't know any other country on this planet that is so keen to bring all the quality possible in something that costs 250 pound <laughs> so are, are there are a lot of dealers here the specialist dealer that would not even touch a lot speaking of the price range stupid i must say because you need the next generation yeah, but of course Anyway, so this what, is then. What I thought I would do is, if someone's watching this and, and they're they're just starting out in hi-fi, it's very rare that you get a chance to hear from someone who's behind the speaker. So if someone's just bought a pair of Diamond, any of the Diamond 12 range, how would you advise them to best set them up in terms of maybe placement, in terms of towing? How, how would you maybe maximize their sound? I mean, it depends a little bit on, on the rooms they are in. So basically, we didn't design them to stand in seven meters distance from the from the back wall um, so they can they can work not against the back world a wall but you know they don't have to be completely free so that is one of the principles where we said this is a kind of class of loudspeakers where people really don't have them free standing in two meters away from the wall so they are relatively um, they are relatively easy to handle from that way. Um, I mean, all the other things depend a lot on the on the on the living room. I mean, we have the same kind of method uh, to decouple the box from the amplifier with a higher resistance um, coil and more magnet than we use in Borg. So you know, this is the same principle to make them more universal. Uh, usable for um, for amplifiers, so they are easier to to uh, to run with all sort of amplifiers. Um, towing in depends again on the distance and and how people like the imaging. You know, I mean, I always have them directly to me, and then a little bit back, so that they're just running, you know, a little bit away from me. What's but this is what. I so you would tow them in on yourself first and then maybe ease them out. Is, is that what you mean? And then I yeah, put them back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, okay. so 
and then I adjust the imaging depending on the room where I'm in. So then I do it in, in for me in the best way. On shows, for example, we do it completely different because on shows they are, you know, even looking, I mean, I'm not saying each other, but a, a lot um, more in that direction. Um, and the reason is that every loudspeaker, and that's why you, you tilt them in or out, um, if they are halfway well designed, they will change the response curve, balance, you know, a little bit up and down, uh, depending on how far you uh, rotate them. When you are in the show and you're, for example, sitting on the left side, then the loudspeaker that you are very close to, when it's tilted away from you, is lower in level. But the other one on the other side is looking at you. And this is higher in level. So this is how we normally do it on shows uh, to get an image. And if you do it right, you sit outside and you hear the, the, the singer in the middle behind the loudspeakers, even you're not sitting in the middle. So, so really so that, these could, are, oh, so that, that could be an approach that someone could take if they're trying to maybe make a much larger sweet spot. Is, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have thought yeah. of that, to be honest. It makes a lot of sense, though. I mean, again, that is something I also, um, you know, learned. I'm not saying I learned that from Ishiwata because we were using the same principle in the old days uh, with ALR Jordan for uh, a rear speaker, you know, so that when you're not sitting in the middle, you have a kind of compensation between the left and the right rear speaker. Uh, but but he was doing that on shows and, and every time he was doing that, uh, people ask, you know, why are you doing that? And I see comments and... I was planning with my friend Rainer Fink, who is working for Marantz, to do a kind of white paper showing exactly what it does, and we will properly do that. Um, so doing all the measurements and see how that behaves so that people understand why he did it and why we do it. I mean, funnily enough, a couple of years ago, I went to a hi-fi show in London, and there was a, a Ken Ishiwata demo of, of, for Marantz with uh, Q Acoustic speakers, and he had them exactly what you just explained, very aggressively towed in, kind of facing kind of across each other. And I was sit I was at right at the back of the room. I was vi videoing the, the presentation. I was right in the middle. So on the sweet spot. And I, I thought that would maybe make a wider sweet spot, but worse in the middle, but it didn't. The middle was still just as good, but there was a very open sound with it. And that was the first time I'd ever seen a, a demonstration where the speakers were that crossed over. And to my amazement, it actually, it worked really well. Uh, I mean, he he was really the the world champion on making demos. <laughs> the last the last demo he did was with us in in uh, in Germany, uh, Süddeutsche Halfi Tage, um, and that was, and he was already quite ill. Um, but you know, when he said when he was starting his demo and he had his music, he managed, and I have still don't know how he did it to have a voice, you know, and some noise flying over in the room yeah, from, yeah, yeah. from from the ceiling. And you saw people that, uh, I mean, you know, he could get away with that. I mean, if I would have done it, they would have beaten me, you know, and say, <laughs> oh, play music and not, you know, this kind of signal. But he could do it. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, he might have played that same song for that same demo that I went to. Interesting. Yeah. There, there was a lot of up in the air sound, which was amazing to me at the time. I was like, wow, that's really, yeah. really impressive. Um, well, I, I do want to move on to something else, but I'm just going to ask one cheeky question. And this might be useful to people. Don't answer it if you don't need to, uh, if, you, if you can't answer it. But out of the Diamond 12 range, which of the speakers would be maybe your favorite or would be maybe the best starting most for someone's money? Um, I was this week, or was end of next last week? No, end of last week. I was, I was listening again to to some of the samples. So we get samples from production, where we do the measurements and check them with our reference just to see how how well they follow. Um, and I was listening to a pair of the twelve two, okay. the bigger ones, and they were really really nice. I mean, you know, I. I don't, you know, if you have five children, do you say this is the best one or this is the one I like most? You like them all. <laughs> uh, but I, I would spend a little bit more money and go for the 12 too. Interesting. Quite a lot of people um, have contacted me after my 12.1 review and said the 12.2 seems really interesting. So that's nice that you've kind of... Is, is that just a bit of a bigger sound? Is, is that what it would give you maybe over the 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, when you have a tiny little loudspeaker and the cabinet is in, in a, it's restricted in size, it's not easy. So, you know, with every step up, you get a little bit more and, and you hear that. So scale gets bigger. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. It's not, you know, that it's the monster sound, but it's mm. it's really making it bigger and more realistic. And I mean, you asked me which one I think was the one that I would have chosen, and that is probably this one. Okay, okay. Well, obviously, after yeah, using the 12.1 a lot, I was really impressed by that. So anything that gives you any more on that for, for a small bit more money it makes can make a lot yeah. of sense financially. So I just want to quickly talk to you a bit about kind of – general questions about building speakers and designing speakers because I suppose what what do you think is the biggest challenge and the biggest obstacle to overcome when designing any type of speaker <laughs> I mean you're asking 20 years too late <laughs> because you know I'm, I'm a really lazy guy so that means you know whenever there's something difficult I try to find a way to solve it, but without repeating myself 20 times. Um, I mean, the speakers got better in the last 20 years, definitely. I always hear, oh, it's the same thing, you know, nothing happened, and uh, but that's not really true. Um, drive units got a lot better. The distortion level of drive units compared to 20 years ago is, is really, really dramatic. I'm not saying you couldn't make one 20 years ago, but it would cost a lot. And sometimes it would be an accident um, because, you know, yeah, you see, I mean, when I was working with, with Viva and Scanspeak, and that was for many years, there was, they had a magnet system with some copper rings um, at a certain position. And the idea was because, you know, when you make a crossover, you have the impedance of your loudspeaker, uh, but without compensation, the impedance would, you know, change um, with, with the position in or out. More iron, higher inductance, uh, coil out, less iron in the voice call, um, you get less inductance. And I thought it's not a good idea that your, that your crossover sees this, you know, changes in, um, in inductance. And so this is the load of the crossover. And I think that was probably right, but nowadays we have this wonderful, nice, intelligent clipple system that tells us doing this kind of compensation reduces the inductance variation over excursion and therefore intermodulation and distortion by a lot. So the, it was the distortion was lower on the old days. We didn't know why. Nowadays we know and we can make a loudspeaker uh, in the Wharfdale, for example, with the same low distortion figures that we had 25, 30 years ago in a very expensive one. So this is what we have nowadays. So we can make good loudspeakers for relatively small money because we have a lot more toys to work with. And this is the Clipple measurement system. That is a very strange system because when you have loudspeakers with better behavior, the measurements get sometimes really strange, but it's it's a system that looks for the, 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 the errors that it can measure, and then it puts it in a mathematical model um, and says, okay, this is this and this and this, and when the error is very small, there's nothing to fit. Um, but this opened eyes for many people, including me. So we had one of the first systems here in Germany. I think my... my um, Customer number is number four or something like that. I'm very, very early or 14. I don't know, remember, but very early. Um, so this was important. The second thing is um, simulation technology. So, I mean, some people, and maybe I, I have the same opinion, always say the loudspeaker is only as good as the toys that engineers can, can buy <laughs> and use. And, you know, when I started, um, you know, that was the brilliant Kier thing, you know, with this, with this, with this ink thing that was writing on, um, yeah, on a piece of paper, complicated and very expensive. So though that when they invented, oh, I don't need measurements, I do it all by ear, yeah, because they didn't have a measurement instrument. <laughs> 
then we had the then we had um, Melissa. Melissa was the next one that was computer based, and you could do really FFT. You could make a response curve, and everybody was buying that one. And yep, they started to make better resp better uh, loudspeaker because it was easy to measure and it was affordable. Um, but they, they never measured distortion because they couldn't measure distortion with, with this um, Melissa. And so, you know, from one generation to the next generation, um, you got better measurement instrument. Nowadays, you know, you, there's a program called ATA that runs on a sound card. I mean, you get a measurement microphone from Bayer or, you know, from from other companies, even with a built-in USB port for 120 euro. And they were perfectly, the, 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 the software cost 70 euro or whatever. And I use RoomyQ Visit. There are some folks in the US that makes this program, wonderful program, uh, costs nothing. I mean, you know, and, and you can do distortion, you can do impulse, you can do impedance, you can do waterfall, you can do everything for free. So everybody has access to this kind of measurement instrument. And, and that all makes loudspeakers better because then people use the tool. If you have to buy it for 50,000. Um, the next big step and the big jump is simulation. There's a program called Comsol. I mean, that cost 50, 60,000, but that's a fraction because that's what other program costs per year to rent the big packages, ANSYS or whatever. So suddenly this is affordable. And when it's affordable, then people buy it and use it. And so the, the progress in, in loudspeaker technology is all you know, in parallel with what kind of measurement and simulation and other things you get. Um, and, that's, and so we still have a lot of progress and um, there will be even more in the future. Simulation will be cheaper. We will have programs that are easier to operate and there are still some areas in the loudspeaker we can make better. That's very interesting. I mean, I mean, funnily enough, people do say that, you know, more you can get better speakers more affordable nowadays. And after recent experience, you definitely can. But it, it's also a case that, you know, when you do spend more, you do get more as well. That's that's definitely something that I've experienced as well, purely because I assume, like what you said about earlier, there's better components, better design, more that can be put into to the speaker in terms of the future obviously we've come a long way like you've just been describing say for example 10 20 years down the line can you see different materials or what might you see as the next huge advancement in speaker technology yeah i hope nobody of my customers is listening now <laughs> um, i always think that material is just i know sometimes when i really have a bad day i say Material technology is only for engineers who don't know how to design a proper size or a proper shape. Um, so, but maybe that's not completely correct. Um, so there are materials that work better or less good. Uh, but, you know, I have no problems to use paper all the time because paper is a very universal and flexible material. Um, and it can, um, yeah, and it can make wonderful sounding loudspeakers. You know, we have this woven materials like Kevlar or glass fiber or carbon fiber, where everybody is telling me, ah, oh, you make bulletproof vest out of it. <laughs> yeah. well, I hope nobody is shooting on his, on his loudspeaker. So I don't know if that is a, a very good um, argument. But, you know, when you have a woven material, you know, then you have fibers in different directions. And they get bonded together with, um, with resin, for example. But as a result, oops, um, but as a result, they have um, stiffness that is different in different direction because the, the fiber, uh, and this fiber is similar and in the middle it's different. And that helps on loudspeakers because um, then you have less resonances. You can, you know, make it a little bit better working because the, the negative thing on a round loudspeaker is that the distance from here to here is always the same. So when you have a problem here, a reflection or whatever, it goes around and you have it everywhere. So it, in easy words, and by using a kind of fiber, you can, you can split that. And yes. that's the, the, yes, the so benefit of this fiber. Yes, yeah, so materials can be of benefit, and I assume measurements and improving measurements and 
you know, I, I, as a speaker, are you still learning? You've been doing it for 20, 20 odd years. Are you still learning in terms of the work you do? Yeah, of course, definitely. I mean, first of all, as I said, I'm really lazy. So whatever problem exists that takes too much time, we try to find out how to solve it because then it doesn't take out too much time. Um, and yeah, you know, when we did the um, our, um, our cabinet vibration solving uh, program, and that was really a, a program where Marcus, our, our vibration specialist, was really working on. On setups, he developed a, his own technique to measure the material mix. And we did many, many different combinations of panels and glue in the middle and bitumen and God knows what else starting with the old BBC thing, with the papers that they presented just as a starting point. And, and then as a result, we now have a kind of toolbox and, and some simulations. Um, and so before we even built the first loudspeaker, he gets the 3D drawing from the drawing guy. He puts it into his program. He simulates uh, the bracing and what kind of panel setup we need. And then we give that to the next guy who builds the cabinet and then it ends up in the listening room. Because that was the big frustration for me. Um, you know, we know we knew how to make crossovers and drive units. But when you build everything together, put it in the listening room and say, Ooh. so, you know, and then start. So what is it, you know? <laughs> Um, and in, in many cases, it's just the cabinet vibration that really are masking, you know, the mid band or the, the lower mid band or the higher mid band. Um, and then you start looking at it. And even so, we have a scanning laser vibrometer that shows you what it is. It doesn't tell you how to fix it. It only shows you what is happening. It shows a problem. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so, um, so therefore, there is a lot of improvement you can do and a lot of things you you have to learn i mean if you ask me what i'm learning right now i mean um, we want to improve the spiders of a loudspeaker because this is still a kind of black art and voodoo <laughs> um, no really no real uh, simulation program can deal with it because the material properties are changing over frequencies with stretch horrible and and so like we did this program for the cabinet vibration we are now dealing with a with a spider because i want to simulate a spider one day put it in product put it into the product measure it and confirm that it fits that saves us many many samples and makes that reliable so and for all that you have to learn because i mean you know you can have some knowledge to say, ah, when this is happening, you know, this you do, and you put some damping material here, and you change something here. Uh, but this is not the scientific approach that I personally like to do, because I want to, to know why this modification does a change. There's a lot to do on, on the final voicing on the loudspeaker, where I have no idea why it is. But the ones that I can answer, we try. Okay, so so really, what what I'm taking from that, Carl, is there's a, like an OCD level of looking at every facet of a speaker's design, driver design, to try and maximise the performance, but also be able to measure it so that it's repeatable, and then you can you can you know what's right and wrong, and then you can improve it. Is is that correct? Is it... yes, yeah, makes sense. What what I'd like to do now is go over to some questions, if that's okay, because there's been a few good questions coming throughout throughout the video. What, one question that's been asked is um, about EPOS uh, products and EPOS speakers. Are they are they in the pipeline at all? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the, the original planning was to have them earlier, but uh, Corona really um, stopped that because, you know, I can't travel. Um, but that doesn't mean we are not working on it. Uh, but I said, you know, EPOS was a fascinating company in the, in the early years. You know, Robin Marshall is somebody who really had some ideas. Um, then later on, it was done uh, together with Morton Short. And that's why I met Steve Harris the first time when he was in charge. And there was a lot of different things done in, in EPOS. The last EPOS loudspeakers I have seen looked relatively normal. So that means 
they looked like a conventional two-way system and I couldn't see why they were EPOS. But, you know, they were okay, I don't know. I mean, I, I never listened to them, so I cannot say they are wrong in any way, but EPOS needs something that is in the tradition and in, in the spirit of the old EPOS. I had so many really, really nice uh, people um, contacting me. When do we have it? When can we have it? One guy said, I want the first one with a serial number, number one. You have to promise me I get that one. Uh, and I promised it to him. Um, but it has to be something special. I mean, we have, it was always a metal dome that was in Epos. Um, yeah. Hmm. When did you see a, a metal dome, uh, you know, the last time that was really nice sounding? There are a few around, but they are really out of fashion. Um, so we started to design a metal dome. So it's a little bit bigger, it's 28 millimeter. Um, and, and so, you know, we want to have something in the tradition, but it has to be special. It has to be a good quality and it has to be an improvement because we use all the modern things like cabinet vibration control in this loudspeaker. I'm still, I'm still, trying to, um, I mean, to make up my mind, for example, if I would also make an EPOS loudspeaker with a BMR driver, because that was kind of, um, yeah, we, I did a lot of it um, in the past, you know, the, the name was always with BMRs. And so I, I have a parallel development. So there's a BMR also in development. If we don't use it for EPOS, we use it for something else. <laughs> Um, so it, it has to be something special. We will have a bookshelf first, so that was decided, and then a floor stander. And it will never be, you know, 27 models in every price class of this planet. It will be somewhat crazy, unusual, but characterful loudspeakers and not the next no-name thing that you don't recognize when it's on the shelf with seven analogs. So, so really then this, this, it's in the works it's been developed but it will come when it's ready and it's going to be worth the wait is really what you're what you're saying yeah Excellent. yeah what, what another question that was a really good question actually for you know through i need to flick through again but a couple of people asked you know in terms of testing products you know what, what different amplifiers do you use do you use different cables and obviously i was going to say about the listening room you know do you try and simulate different listening positions and environments to try and test speakers um yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, when you do your 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 initial design, you put them in different rooms, virtual, to see how they react. But over the years, you find out what kind of role of you need to be to behave well um, in a listening room. Um, our own listening room is is not that big. It's not sixty square meters or whatever, so it's more in a normal range. It's well treated, but it's not overly damped like a studio um, room, you know, and, and where you have your studio monitors and you sit two meters. Um, so we follow the regulations. There are some IEC rules how to design a listening room, uh, and we do that as well. Um, so, but we have our fixed um, setup that only changes when we do smaller bookshelf or loudspeaker that go to a wall. Then there will be an additional wall behind the loudspeaker to mimic that. Um, our own setup is, yeah, so we have a sort of paranoia on this one because um, when you when you design a, a loudspeaker, you know, you can compensate a lot in your loudspeaker, like, you know, our switches in the Borg. Uh, but in, in real life, you have to do that, you know, one time and it has to fit as many systems as possible. So our system is pretty much fixed. Um, so the, let's start from the end. Uh, speaker cables that we are using right now is from TCI, um, King Snake, whatever. That was a cable that we, I, I don't know the name to be honest, no, um, but it's a really nice, it's the bigger one that they have. It's, it's not crazy expensive, but it sounds really nice. Um, so um, the amplifier is, is a homemade one because we also do electronics and this was a project that we started and it's a mixture between 
some of the classic German designs with some name ideas. Um, we also use tube amplifiers, but that is, you know, a vintage Redford tube that I use and Michael's in an Austin um, one. And on Friday, I will get the big monoblocks from Kana. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, first you're gonna, prototype. You're going to enjoy. Oh, 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 so, something new then. Not the ones that I've just reviewed. Something different. Shh. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oops, you should, maybe you shouldn't have said that. I, well, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, it is, you know, it is. I don't think it is a secret. Uh, I have no idea what it costs, and I have no idea. But, you know, we have a very good relation with them. So they're using Borg in development. And um, I wanted to really try this um, because I like the, the other ones. I had the, I was testing here the other ones, and I had them here, and, and I really, really like them. And the phono preamplifier will never leave from our room here. So they are just set in stone and they will never change. Or maybe they make a new one, but I don't know. <laughs> um, our preamplifier is from a company called Funk, F-U-N-K. Um, this, this is a company that normally makes um, professional equipment for the, for the broadcast um, industry and for studios. They are. They measure so good that we can't measure them because they they measure better than our our audio position that we have, um, and it's yeah the closest thing to a wire or whatever you know that something that somebody said to a preamplifier, uh, but together with the mono preamp uh, power amplifiers from Cano, we also get the new preamplifier. And this is a tube preamplifier, and I'm really looking forward to have that in the system. Um, the funk that we have, we also use because I like uh, open reel tape recorders. So we have three in, in the listening room, and you need something for the routing of the signals. Um, and that's why we have them. Um, I do a lot of streaming, to be honest. I don't have a... I don't have a um, a CD player in the listening room now. Um, so we have a, um, a Linux based system. It's, it's rock. No, it's not rock. It's, it's rune. It was rock, but now it's a uh, Italian, um, Linux called audio Linux. Um, and it's a server that we build ourselves with a fanless, um, case, um, and a bigger i7, uh, processor. Um, and the endpoint is a small industrial um, motherboard, uh, always linear power supply and whatever you do to make it good sounding. So I'm very much into this computer audio. This is another thing, and nobody can explain me why a bloody uh, Ethernet cable sounds so different, you know. And I very often I have people who say, you're stupid, you know, this is voodoo and this is snake oil. And I, I always tell them, I wish it would be, yeah. because I would make my life a lot easier, you know, fiddling with bloody switches and network cables to optimize the sound character that you want is not really fun. So, um, yeah, and that is our, our main source nowadays with Ruin and Tidal and Cobus. Um, and the turntable we have as well. Um, I have a few turntables, but right now, it's a, it's a, one of the bigger one transrotors uh, with a um, with a long SME arm, one of the modern ones. I don't know what the model number is, but it's a mixture between a long tube and some of the um, bearings of a five. Um, and my cartridge is a, a Fundenhul Colibri Gold. Um, but I have a few ones, but that's the one that is yeah. built in right. So that's, that's a very audiophile system, isn't it? That, that's a system there you've just ex dis ex described and explained is very audiophile, someone who really cares about sound quality. And then I, I suppose that makes your job easier in a sense of listening tests, isn't it? Listening to different speakers, listening to differences, try, trying to yeah. work things out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, this is a system that I really like to use for almost everything, you know. So why should a cheap speaker use a cheap amplifier? Uh, when you're working on it. I mean, once you've done it, then you have to check uh, with um, with other amplifiers to see how it behaves, you know, how stable the amplifier is. 
but we are not trying to, to design loudspeakers with a crossover that really kill amplifiers. So normally our speakers are really easy to drive. Um, so I have a, a few amplifiers from, from Marantz um, that we use for the, for the cheaper ones. You know, we always have one of the latest ones. Um, I also have um, the, the Rotel A11, C11, the tribute one, because, you know, this is something that we, we started with Ishiwata, but he couldn't um, finish it, so we finished it. And so this is one of the amplifiers we really like, of course. Um, so this is then the other end of the spectrum that we test. I still got a system from, um, from Name, a 252 with a, uh, with a big power supply, DR. Um, we have the power amplifier. It's, I think it's a 160, an older one, but nicely, you know, modified. But it's just to have a different, a different direction. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is, you know, what we, what we normally like to use and that we know quite, quite well. Interconnect cables in the big system are from Verter. Um, recently discovered, really nice, really nice um, cable. Um, and I'm just waiting for the next bigger one uh, to test it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not completely crazy. You know, I don't believe that cables who are very expensive are necessarily better than cheaper ones. Um, you know, there's a certain material you have to use, you know, the, the connectors should be proper and, and the materials and the isolation, you know, should not be PVC or whatever. Um, but these Verter cables are really nice and not so strange, high price. We still got a few QED cables here for the cheaper systems that we use. So we have a kind of a collection of of electronics, how it is. And when I need something from Arans, I call my friend Rainer and he probably brings me one to listen to if I need to. Yeah, so, so really, and you're test, testing lots of different kit, lots of different combinations, different things to try and to try and fine tune and make sure everything's correct for all different customers, for really all different speaker products as well, isn't it really? At all different price points and different levels. So um, yeah. Carl, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I hope the people watching have really enjoyed it because you know, I've really, really enjoyed it. I've got a lot out of it. So, you know, thank you very much for coming on. Um, well, maybe I was talking too much. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. So, obviously, so thank you to everybody for joining in either live or after the event to uh, enjoy this special guest live stream video with Carl Heinz Fink from Fink Team. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, smash the thumbs up button, as they say. Subscribe to Pursuit Perfect System YouTube channel if you haven't already. And I'll definitely see you soon for more reviews, live you know, live guest uh, videos like this, and lots more. So huge thank you for you to watch. A huge, a huge thank you to you for watching. And I'll see you soon, guys. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Cole, is that okay? <laughs>